thank you for having us um, tonight. So I guess we'll just jump right into everything. Um, so I think the first question is how and when the Pullins ended up in Minto. So, Linda? Well, that's well. <laughs> okay. Uh, back in 1918, uh, some of y'all remember uh, Hardy and Maude Jones, who is uh, Ronnie Jones' parents. Grandparents. Grandparents. Uh, Maude was a culprit. They, their family came from Zebulon, not Zebulon, uh, Polk County, Georgia. Well, uh, the Cockwits moved to Mentone, and then uh, uh, sometime later, uh, some of the rest of the Cockwit family came, and they got my granddad pulling to move them out here. And he was so impressed with the place that he just went back home and moved his family out here. <laughs> so they, the Pullins have been here since 1918. Uh, That's, that's how they wound up wound up here. So how about the Granny Gracie side, the green side? Okay, the, my mom's uh, dad was a, a green. They came uh, to the Mentone area in eighteen in the early eighteen eighties, probably. Uh, there's several children, and Granddaddy was the second to the youngest, I guess. He was born in eighteen eighty five. He was the first one of the kids that was born. Uh, in the area here and uh so they they've been here the greens have been here since the uh, early 1880s and uh, the, uh let's say green uh great day great day green married shigley oh and the shigley's came from michigan in the early 1880s and Grandma Shigley was a Keith, and the Keiths came to settled in the valley about 1820. So our family, some of our family's been in this area for 200 years. Wow. Wow. It's a, it's a good so how did Granny and Happy, your parents, how did they meet in all of this? Probably at church. Um, church? But they have a beautiful love story because my mother was 15 and daddy was 25 when they started, as they would call it then, courting. And um, my grandmother didn't much like the idea of her going with this man. So she sent her off to school to South Carolina, but she only stayed one semester and came home. And Robert was born about the time that uh, mother came back from South Carolina, she wouldn't go back to school because she had a baby brother and, and she liked daddy. And so they were talking about getting married in 1941. And um, then Pearl Harbor happened and daddy went to the Navy and she waited for him four years till he came back in 1945 and they got married. Next year I was born. Two years after that, Walt was born. I was born in October. He was born in October. The next October after Walt was born, our sister Ann was born. The next October, Kay was born. <laughs> and then a couple of years later, Bob came along in January. And one time, some of y'all may not remember Catherine Bain. She liked to ask people embarrassing questions. And, so she asked Daddy one time why all of his and mother's kids were born in October. And he said, well, that's simple. January's a cold month on lookout now. <laughs> <laughs> and, the, and the October birthdays continued on through. And Laura's born in yeah, October. Yeah, I was born in October. Um, <laughs> Helen, who married in, her birthday's October, and then some of the other cousins, cousins yeah. and whatnot. So. Apparently, uh, apparently, uh, January's cold everywhere. <laughs> so, um, so what were your childhoods like? Um, what was it like growing up um, in this area? And, you know, like, what kind of games and activities did y'all have when you were kids that you did? Well, <laughs> I 
also we had perfect childhood. We had, you know, built-in playmates in the family. Um, we had the whole woods to play in. Um, well, now we started out in town. Yeah. Up in the right. city. <laughs> downtown Minnetone. <laughs> <laughs> and the traffic was beginning to get worse and they couldn't keep me at home. That's <laughs> true. And uh, so, uh, Daddy bought part of the old dream place over in the country at the time and to get me out of the sea. Now, is that, do they call it Nottingale? Is that what they used to call that? Well, is Bankhead, that? between Nottingale and Bankhead. Gotcha. <clears throat> we, we'd start off every year when school was out by building a dam across the creek, which is not a very big creek, but we'd make it deeper so we could play in it. We it needed to dry it up. Yeah, we made um, playhouses and woods. We we'd have animal funerals. <laughs> we would. Um, what else did we do? Well, me and brother Bob, uh, we played. With, we made roads and made better trucks and toys. We made roads all over the yard. Back then, you didn't mow the yard. You you just kind of kept the weeds down. And so you tried to help with that? Well, I guess that's <laughs> part of it. And my sisters and I would play dolls and paper dolls. And we had stairs in our house, so we'd have paper doll houses all up and down the stair steps. Then Walt and Bob would come through and mess up all of our paper dolls. <laughs> so what, what year did Pappy build, or what year did the house, Pappy's house get built? It'll be 50. They started it in 54. Three, 53. Yeah, we moved in in December 53. <laughs> well, we didn't move in the big house. Yeah, we did. Oh, we did? We moved. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember that. That's a story. Well, you were little. <laughs> well, I was six when we moved from Mentone over there. And we lived in the what was going to be Daddy's garage for that first summer. And then the house wasn't finished, but we went ahead and moved in it that fall. I think it, it had just gotten on mama's nerves with five little kids in that 24 by 24 log house. <laughs> um, so outside of outside of your home slot in the, in the area, in the community, what was that like at that point of time? I know you said like the big town of Mentone, but uh, I think that was even smaller than what it is today. Everybody knew everybody. Um, yeah, we we had the only telephone between Mentone and the Georgia line, I think. For a while, yeah. And all the neighbors always came to our house to use the telephone. <laughs> and we got to know everybody. everybody's <laughs> problems firsthand. <laughs> <laughs> The community was, uh, I mean, like everybody knew everybody, everybody helped each other out. You shared your garden vegetables, you shared your joys and sorrows, and you know, it was just um, a community, I mean, a real community. And you had a sense of um, belonging, a sense of caring. And I thought everybody loved me. <laughs> in, the, in the summertime, we spent all summer going to Bible schools. Every church had, back then, most of them had a two-week Bible school. Sometimes. So Mama would make sure we went to Bible school all summer. <laughs> Give her a little rest. So, so we went to, there's what, what, four or five churches we went to that many Bible schools all summer. <laughs> so what did, if, when y'all were younger and until the point of time y'all would leave, y'all would move out and y'all were grown, what did, um, what did Granny and Pappy do for, for work, for employment? Well, when we was little, uh, Dad was a carpenter. His dad was a carpenter before him and they built a lot of the older houses around Mentone. And uh, I guess uh, 
it got to where Cartner work wasn't regular enough, but he got a regular job at the cotton mill in Trine in uh, 58, wasn't it? I believe it was something like 58. And he worked over there, so he retired. And mom always uh, stayed home, and she had a pretty good job at home. <laughs> so what was, with her being, you know, stay-at-home mom, what, what is, and we'll start with Aunt Linda. So what was one of your, well, what was one of your most um, influential memories of, of Granny, of your mom? Mm -hmm. Her patience <laughs> and her contentment. I would I would tell her all the time we needed something you know what we needed a better piece of furniture we needed to go somewhere and she was always what we have is good enough and you know I, I admire that now it made me mad then but it, I admire it now and then you know she taught she had the patience to teach my sisters and me to sew and cook and do all those kind of things. How to hoe the garden and, you know, don't cut down the beans, just get the weeds, you know. <laughs> and um, so what, sewing is a family tradition that apparently got passed down because we brought some quilts tonight. This first one is from our great-grandmother Pulling, who passed away in 1889. That was my daddy's grandmother. And the middle one is from our grandmother who passed away in December of 54. And this one on the end is one that our mother made. Wow. Yeah, that's beautiful. Um, well, the same question, but for Pappy. What was your most influential thing about Pappy? Remember Pappy? His stories. <laughs> <laughs> Our daddy was a storyteller, and he was so funny. Um, we didn't have a TV. He thought that we shouldn't have a TV until we got through school because he wanted us to do well in school. So um, he bought us a set of encyclopedias. Yeah, he did, and he bought us a set of encyclopedias. And Walt and I used to see what we could find out that the other one didn't know. You know, <laughs> but. Um, he would sit around at night after we got through with our homework and tell us stories. Uh -huh. And they were, you know, some of them got repeated many times, but they're still, we enjoyed listening to Daddy's stories. I can remember when we was little and uh, Mother didn't have a, well, she may have had a washing machine, but I can remember her washing, uh, heating the water in a, in a, a cast iron tub out in the yard to heat water to wash clothes in. And I can remember her out there washing clothes singing. <laughs> and one of her songs was, uh, Oh, what a beautiful morning. Oh, what a beautiful morning. Her out there washing clothes <laughs> in a wash tub. <laughs> That's a good How about Pappy? Well, his worth it, work ethics. Uh, he, uh, was always had a regular job, but he was always working at home doing, built the house essentially by himself. Mm -hmm. And uh, when he died, the house still wasn't finished, but <laughs> he's still working on it. <laughs> but, uh, but his worth ethics is something that has impressed me and, and I hope that a lot of it rubbed off on me. <laughs> but uh, he, uh, he always uh, had a big garden and uh, uh, always grew peanuts. When they, when the family moved to Alabama in 1918, they brought their peanut seed with them from Georgia. And until uh, probably two years ago, it was Alabama peanuts grew on Lookout Mountain. And I kind of dropped the ball. I, <laughs> I planned them, but they didn't come up. So I don't know what's happened to the Alabama peanuts. <laughs> wow. Um, so I know both of you said um, 
some things about the gardens. Um, I know that's one thing that us as, as grandchildren, um, my cousins, myself, my brother, um, during the summers, I'm sure even during the fall when we had school, you know, we were we were put to work in the garden as well. Um, we were digging potatoes. I hated shucking corn. I hated finding the worms. <laughs> Those silkworms, the corn, it, I hated that part, but uh, digging potatoes were probably my favorite. Um, I remember we still had an outhouse, an actual outhouse out uh, next to the barn with the gardens. Um, so there was a lot of things from from then that you know still passed through to, to my generation. I remember the uh, the old wash tub Granny had, not the cast iron one, but the the old white one with the uh, washboard on it. But, and she still had that along with her regular washing machine uh, when I was a child. So. She was very content with, with what she had. What were meal times like? Um, you know, with having a garden. We never went hungry. <laughs> <laughs> meal time was regular. I mean, you could almost see. And everybody was there too. Everybody, and a lot of times a few extras. And, um, and we all sat around the table. We said the blessing. We ate homegrown vegetables. Sometimes homegrown chickens and eggs, mm -hmm. and, um, and we all stayed and talked until we were excused from the table. It was like you see on Mayberry or something. <laughs> <laughs> um, I know, of course, Granny was semi-famous for her cakes and candies and things that she would make. Um, what is your What's your favorite thing that Granny would make? Or the thing you remember the most, maybe? I remember the, the Christmas candy. She would start um, several weeks before Christmas and start making candy. And she would save her box. She was always sending cards to people. And she'd get these boxed cards and she would save the boxes and then she would put homemade candy in them and all her teachers would get one. The mail carrier. The mail carrier, the milkman, the preacher, <laughs> at, you know, Sunday school teachers. Everybody got some Miss Gracie's ki uh, homemade candy for Christmas. <clears throat> her homemade fruit cakes, which she started in mm -hmm. July, I guess, wasn't it? I mean, real early. And uh, she'd make her fruit cakes and uh, put them up on the shelf in the pantry for Christmas. I reckon they, they aged. Maybe that's one of the good. Um, I remember Granny telling the story of. Um, asking what kind of cakes you guys would want for your birthdays. Yes. Uh, she would ask us the same as well when we were children. Um, and one of her favorites to tell them you is like, you were like maybe two or three and you wanted boo cake and boo ice cream. And I got boo so. cake and blue ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what about in this area, what was, what was the education like? What was, what was offered at that time? Moon Lake. <laughs> <laughs> but did that go all the way to like graduating? No, just no. through sixth grade. Well, when you... It, it went to the eighth grade until I got in the seventh grade and then they started sending everybody past sixth grade to Valley Head. So I went seven through seventh grade at Moon Lake. Um, and then we went to Valley Head and then we graduated. Then they opened Northeast and we got to go to Northeast. <laughs> I always said everything I knew I learned at Moon Lake. <laughs> oh, that other just marking time. <laughs> um, what, what were some of your favorite subjects um, and maybe your favorite teacher and what you learned, especially from that teacher? My favorite was recess. <laughs> I kind of like history and geography. Uh, I wasn't too good at math and, and wasn't good at all at English. 
I mean, I got by, but that's just barely. What about your teacher? teacher. Favorite. My favorite teacher? Well, it definitely wasn't Miss Foy Jones. <laughs> <laughs> hey, people here kin to her. <laughs> I will tell on you. Uh, what I had been, I was in the third grade when Walt started to school, and somebody would come around and say, Miss Foy's paddling your brother. And I was like, oh no. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I guess uh, my favorite teacher at Moon Lake is probably Ovi Carr because uh, he, uh, well, I guess he was a good teacher, but he wasn't real demanding and he liked to entertain us. He, uh, he's a short, fat guy <laughs> and he could turn upside down and walk on his hands. And just every few days, he'd. Put on a demonstration for us and walk around <laughs> in front of the classroom upside down. It's funny you said that because Pappy, that was one of his things, was standing on his head. Was he? Mm -hmm. He would stand on that. Yeah, we've got some funny pictures. And then after we got to Valley Head, I guess, uh, I guess my favorite teacher in there was Bernie Smartin. Uh, Sharon remembers Mrs. Martin. She wasn't necessarily my best uh, favorite teacher at school, but after I got out of school, we became real good friends. <laughs> and uh, I just admired her a, a whole lot because <laughs> she put up with a lot. <laughs> and, in elementary school, I think I liked every subject. And, and I loved to read. And I remember one time the PTA bought a set of biographies. They would have blue covers on them. I bet Marshall remembers them. And I read every one of them. I just thought those were so inter interesting to read about all these people. And um, my favorite teacher was probably Miss Adams, who, who died and her husband married my grandma. That's another story. But, um, <laughs> but she was, you know, I really liked Miss Adams for a teacher. And then um, in high school, I had several favorite teachers, but I liked Miss Martin too. She was a who. And um, she was a good English teacher, but she was a character. <laughs> I remember her. Do you think your experience um, with the education you got? Did Moon Lake influenced you to be a teacher yourself? Possibly. I did, I, that's not what I had planned to do, but um, that's what I wound up doing. And we had a teacher named Mr. Pat Priest when I was in seventh grade. And then he went to Valley Head and taught my math in the eighth grade and my English in the ninth grade. So he was... Um, a very interesting fella. He had come here from Florida and worked at Camp Cloudmont, and then he decided to stay all year, and, and he taught at Moon Lake and then Valley Head. And he told me that I would be a teacher, and I told him I would not, <laughs> but I did. <laughs> so, yes, probably so. <laughs> um, so, with did Pappy service in the Navy influence you to also go into the Navy, or what influenced you? That's to probably the, Navy? the reason I joined the Navy. Ever since I can remember, Daddy was telling Navy stories, and I thought, you know, I, that's I, I got to do that. Of <laughs> course, he was he joined when when uh, uh, Pearl Harbor was bombed. He volunteered just right right away, and he enlisted for the duration of the war. It wasn't a certain amount of time, so. When, uh, when the war was over, uh, they had to let him out. But uh, he told uh, you know, a lot of funny stories and uh, a lot of, of stories that really, you know, pretty serious stuff. He was always at a repair base, him being a carpenter, he didn't have to go to boot camp or anything, they just put him to work. And uh, he spent a lot of his time in, in the Caribbean and Guantanamo Bay and then in St. Thomas and uh, actually, he went over to Northwest Africa for a little while at a Navy base. Uh -huh. 
And, uh, but one of the funny things he told about was when he was down in the islands, that in their spare time they played baseball. He said they played with different rules down there. He said, uh, when you got up to bat, well, if you hit the ball, you just kept running till they got, got you out. He said, well, I wasn't too good, but one time I hit the ball and it rolled out in about the middle of the field and went in a gopher hole. <laughs> and he said, uh, I made 27 home runs. <laughs> before, before they got the ball dug up and got me out. <laughs> but uh, he, uh, his Navy stories, I guess, influenced me to join the Navy. And uh, I didn't have the kind of experiences he did, but I, I really enjoyed my time in the Navy. And uh, looking back, sometimes I wish I'd have stayed longer, but. Uh, I'm glad to come home. <laughs> and you were you were stationed in Guam. Yeah, I was in Guam for two years, and uh, a, a normal uh, time was 18 months, and uh, you could apply for an extension. And I stayed two years, and uh, I put in for another extension. I, I wanted to stay over there, and uh, I didn't get my. Uh, request in quick enough so they sent me to San Diego but uh I like Guam because uh well there was there was no big cities or nothing but you know just country and uh we got out in the hills and all and and just just had fun <laughs> um so this is this is actually not my first time interviewing my dad I've got to interview him several times for uh, school projects when I was uh, younger. And I remember one question I asked you um, was something along the lines of, you know, how do you think our lives would be different if you had you had stayed in the Navy? And- Well, you wouldn't have been here probably. <laughs> his, his exact answer was, well, you'd probably be half Guamanian. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, living in this um, area, what in Mentone Valley Head area, um, what do you think the greatest, the greatest aspect of that was when you were growing up <coughs> that you well, that you carried on with you throughout your lives? The sense of community, um, the goodness of the people, the, um, it's just, it's just cleaner here and, and pure air. I know my grandma Shigley used to say that they would, she would go off to, she had 12 kids and they lived all over the country and she'd go visit somebody and when they started up the mountain, she'd say, Phew, I could just breathe better on this mountain. <laughs> <clears throat> well, I hadn't really thought about it, but I, uh, I just don't know anywhere else I'd rather be. <laughs> that reminds me of another one of Daddy's stories. Daddy told this story, said there was a, a man lived here and um, he had a whole bunch of kids and they came to church and they were having a revival and so the preacher at the end of the service uh, was having an invitation and um, he told everybody to bow their heads and close their eyes. And this man, he had like seven or eight kids in the congregation and he was looking around trying to see where all these kids were so he could gather them up and take them home you know, when church was over. And the preacher said, uh, sir, I ask you to bow your head and close your eyes. Mm -hmm. And the man didn't. And so the preacher said, sir, do you not want to go to heaven when you die? And the man said, well, I don't reckon so. I don't want to leave Mentone to go nowhere. <laughs> As a child, did you did you see or realize any hardships or challenges that 
your parents or the community itself went through. Hmm. Well, I, I guess things that happened we didn't see as didn't see as hardship because it's just just the way it was. Uh, we uh, we always had plenty to eat and and plenty to wear and we was happy. At least we thought we was. <laughs> and uh, the and most everybody around us is pretty much in the same way, you know. Was, uh, I guess you call it contentment with just been here. Yeah. I don't think the adults talked about their problems in front of their kids. We didn't. Yeah. If they had problems, we didn't. <coughs> we didn't realize it. We were, you know, sheltered from. One thing. Uh, one thing with our parents, because uh, they was married. What? 40, 50, 50 something years, 55. 55 years. And I never heard a cross word between them my whole life. Now, if they had problems, we didn't know about it. And uh, they they just, you know, uh, well, they just got along. Yeah. When I was a child too, we'd never, never heard any, any cross words either uh, between them. So I think that was probably their whole lives. Um, so, say in the Mentone Valley Head area, um, were there certain places that you would go visit that were like historical then? Um, and if not, if they, like some of this maybe a little bit more historical now and like what, how it became historical or um, what the changes between then and now in that was? Well, the big change is the two two main Mentone landmarks no longer exist. Yeah. The hotel and the uh, hitching post, that was two two things that, you know, we remember since, you know, always remembered. Yeah. And I can remember when the when the post office was in the hitching post and I remember going to the post office up there. Dad used to always say, Mom, you know, rides on Sunday afternoon and we'd go places. I remember he took us to Scottsboro when they were about to close the ferry because he wanted us to see the ferry before they closed it. Um, he took us to um, Stevenson to see the power plant. Power plant. Um, just, I mean, you know, we went places and he'd tell us things that either were historical or were about to become historical. <laughs> I remember he came in one afternoon and told us they paved the road from Minto to the state park and we had to drive down there to see. <laughs> yeah. That's been a while back. Um, I actually um, was looking through the archives of the Northeast um, Annuals and you know, I guess for my whole life, the the thirty five has always been paved. You know, as, as far as I can remember, and um, it's always been you know the two lanes on each side. And I was looking through the annuals, and I actually saw where that whole project, you know, from start to finish happened. And so that was kind of uncanny to me. And I know now, um, like there's a lot of roads up here that used to be just dirt roads when I was a kid. So a lot there's. Things are a lot different now. Than they Another little. unusual thing, uh, Dad and his dad were partners, and back uh, Martha Berry had a place out here, and uh, she would uh, send word to Dad that she was coming to Mentown to meet. She wanted him to meet her at the post office. She had a chauffeur that brought her out here, but he wasn't familiar with the road, so. When she'd come to Mentone, she'd uh, meet Daddy at the at the post office and tell her chauffeur to sit on the beach there in front of the post office till they got back, and she'd get Daddy to drive her around all over Mentone. Wow. Well, that's kind of kind of unusual. Martha Berry get get Daddy to drive her around when 
she had a chauffeur and he sat on the beach at Minto. <laughs> Um, what, what are some of your best memories of your, your pooling grand, or do you have a lot of memories of your pooling grandparents? Well, Grandpa pooling died before we were born. He, yeah. he died in 1942. But Grandmother pooling, I just adored her. She was really sweet. And she always had tea cakes in a tin box. And she taught me how to make paper dolls out of the newspaper by folding them. And I had I had cut some and I'd left them at Walt's house. It, they would hold hands and you know they. And then we'd cut doilies out of the newspaper to put our tea cakes on when we ate them. And she was just so patient and kind and sweet. My other grandma was a crazy woman and <laughs> she she cut switches off the lilac bush for. Um, use on my behind. And, um, because you had candy cigarettes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's not all I got switchings for. But what I, I remember I about her. what I remember about Grandma pulling is when we'd be down there and if it was rainy and bad outside, she'd go outside and get sand and bring in the house. And put sand in the floor for us kids to play in the sand. <laughs> what about, uh, about Grandma Adams? What was some of your favorite memories of Grandma Adams? <coughs> well, she taught me how to make tea cakes. And she taught me how to churn. And she always told me to be sweet. She was sweet. My mama was sweet. My daughter's sweet but I think it skipped a generation. <laughs> I remember when Grandma would come to our house. Mother wasn't the greatest housekeeper because she had five little youngins. And Grandma, it didn't matter. Every time she came, she had to do clean something, clean, clean in the house. <laughs> she was the clean housekeeper. Mm. So, recently, well, I don't know how far back it started, but I know um, we just, you just uh, gave us a copy of the book for Granny last year, and then some years before that, um, went on Pappy, so um, Aunt Linda has written little books, booklets, um, kind of on... I mean, some of it's historical, some of it's probably tall tales, um, especially on the Pappy book um, of, of our family history and um, of just memories from the different people in our family and those kinds of things. So what, so when did all of that start? What inspired you to just start recording that? Well, Daddy had so many stories and I had a, a little yellow um, notepad where he had written down some of his stories. And um, so I just decided to write a whole book about him and, and include his stories um, because none of, none of his great-grandchildren, I mean, he, was, he died before any of the mm -hmm. great-grandchildren were born, like my grandchildren and Walt's grandchildren. And, um, so I just thought that would be a good way of keeping his memories. And then last year would have been Mother's 100th birthday, so I decided to write about her. And um, and she has so many wonderful traits that I just thought her grandchildren and great-grandchildren. And, and so I included you grandchildren. Mm -hmm. I let each, I mean, I asked each of you to contribute something of memory, and I was just blown away by what y'all said about her because it was so sweet. You know, the, the grandchildren had such wonderful memories of my mother, of their grandmother, um, that it just, and I think that's great for passing on down to the grandchildren not yet born yet or great-grandchildren. 
um, you know, in Psalm 78 in the Bible, it tells us to tell your children, to tell their children the wondrous works of the Lord and, and the goodness of God, you know, and God blessed our family so with such, I mean, we've just been blessed beyond measure. And um, I think we need to pass that down. I would agree. I think that was, uh, I think the vast majority of us were actually very surprised how articulate my brother could be. Yes. Uh, we, we didn't know he knew how to didn't know use he had those words. <laughs> so it was, uh, it was, both of them were quite lovely. Um, quite lovely. It was, um, I look forward to, to telling, hopefully, my grandchildren one day, be able to read those stories to them and um, hopefully dad maybe tell some tall tales to them like Pappy did for us. Um, so, what um, what advice would you give future generations um, about the importance of family history? Mm -hmm. Listen. Well, obviously, I think <laughs> it's important, or I would read it because I write, you know, because <laughs> I write down things to pass on. Yeah. I don't write down stuff, so I have to have notes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, if, which I'm sure, you know, children and grandchildren will watch this clip of video going on right now, but uh, if they were in this room right now, um, what is, what memory or wishes would you want to share with them that they can carry on to the next generation? One thing is that they should always be kind to each other and to treat others like they want to be treated. And one thing that's pressed on us is to get an education. Uh, our dad, always encouraged us to uh, get a good education and be the best we could be at whatever we do. And I think after, probably after uh, we found some, uh, uh, a letter from Snake College. Sneed College, uh, Dad, uh, of course they had a big family and he, he made it through the ninth to tenth grade, didn't he? He, yes, and his older brother, who worked with his father, drowned in the river out here at uh, Camp DeSoto. They were working at Camp DeSoto in the summer, and his older brother Jack drowned that summer. So Grandpa, who couldn't drive, had to take Daddy, had to take him to work with him, to drive him there and back. And so daddy had to quit school. But for after my Aunt Elaine died, we found a letter that Grandma Pullen had kept all these years from Snead College, all, giving my father a scholarship for the last two years of high school and if he made it on to college. And um, he didn't get to go because he had to go to work with his father. So education was really, he, and we never knew that until until that, until mother showed us the letter after he died. Mm -hmm. And he said, um, but he always said, I didn't have a chance to go on to school like you do, and so you go. And one thing he always said at the beginning of the school year, every year he'd say the same speech, He'd tell us, you know, I expect you to do your lessons, you come home, do your homework. And I want you to do the best you can. You may not can always make all A's in your subjects, but you better make the A in conduct. 
Did that always make an A in common? <laughs> I don't think I did. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not with Miss Bowie anyway. <laughs> so I'm gonna add a question. Um, so out of the five of you children, who was the most mischievous? <laughs> Well, we always said Bob did. <laughs> he was the youngest, so he got blamed for everything. I've done my share. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, this today uh, at Northeast, we had um, our speakers forum, which is where they bring in um, authors and speakers to you know tell about. Um, their books or their literary works and um, during the Q&A time um, right at the end of it Dr. Um, Noble who was asking the questions made a statement that just really stuck with me um, and he said family history is the history um, and so I think that's that's probably one of the truest statements because you know history is made up of each individual family history. So I, I, it just really, really, really stuck with me. So I was just very, very glad to get this moment in history with you two. So it's been, it's been such a good time to spend this time with y'all. Oh, oh, yes. Um, so. Um, this, <laughs> there's a story behind this. This is a wood chain made out of one piece of wood and the chain is uh something like eight inches longer than the piece of wood was it was made out of never been glued together it's all just carved out the story behind this according to daddy <laughs> which may or may not be something yeah. he, said, he started this chain when he was courting he said when courting got done he went to whittling so you see how the chain she turned out. <laughs> he made a small, did that, did he make that yeah. one? This one is also? from mahogany. Yeah, he made that one while he's in the uh, uh, Navy and made out of mahogany wood that was from some of the islands where he was at. But this is this cedar local, local wood here. <laughs> <laughs> Those are great. Um, those are always, I remember those being in the, the chest or hanging up well they were hanging up in your house but i remember there being a chest along with some other things um from the navy yeah he made navy. he made a lot of of course he was a carpenter and done a lot of woodwork in the navy and he made a, a footlocker a wooden chest out of mahogany and his commanding officer uh seen it when he made it he said pullin can you make me one of them and Daddy told him, I said, well, Captain, yeah, I can make one, but on one condition. And he said, well, what's that? He said, uh, make sure mine gets home. And uh, so he went ahead and made the Captain uh, a chest like his. And uh, then just before he left down there, the Captain <laughs> came to him and said, Pullen, I need to tell you how, you, how I got your chest home. <laughs> he said, uh, I had to send that as your personal effects. He said, you know, if something had happened down to you down here, said, you know, nothing of your stuff would have got home. So, <laughs> so he sent Daddy's chest home as his personal effects, like he'd been killed. That's funny. So um, I think at this time we're going to kind of give opportunity for any of any people in the audience to ask any questions or I don't know if you have a memory or something of the Pullen family, I guess if you want to share it. I'd like to. Okay. Uh, especially with these here. Uh, I'm Wes Pullen, for y'all that, that don't know, my daddy and their daddy were brothers. My daddy was the youngest one. And after World War II, he went to pharmacy school and met my wife. And so I grew up in Birmingham. But the thing I remember the most about coming to Mentom. All my aunts and uncles lived up here, there was seven of them up here, is how important family was to all of them. And we always stayed at my Uncle Bill's, their parents' house, because they had a big house. 
And the thing that has always stuck with me the most was the Sunday lunches that we had while we're up here and how much that tradition of eating together still goes mm -hmm. on to this day. Mm -hmm. On Sundays, all of the aunts and uncles and the kids mm -hmm. would come over with a, basically a potluck lunch at Uncle Bill's house. And you've never seen more rambunctious children in your life. <laughs> and to this day, the pulling cousins, females, still get together every year mm -hmm. and go do stuff. The good boys were never that close, but I, <laughs> I remember those. I, those were my fondest memories growing up, was coming up here in the times that we had in Benton, especially the Sunday lunches. I don't know what y'all thought about them, but I love them. <laughs> <laughs> I remember um, with, with the Sunday lunches of trying to figure out how that much food came out of Granny's kitchen when she was in church the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> and lunch was directly after church. Yeah. So. Well, a lot of, like I said, when we did it, it was everybody brought one mm -hmm. or two dishes. So it wasn't like one had to cook everything. Right, right. Yeah. And, but uh, those were some wonderful wonderful gathered time and the, the stories and the food and the homemade ice cream uh. and i think about after those meals all the men would go outside and they'd sit out under the trees and and you'd hear some talking and then they'd all laugh and they were telling each other their stories i guess mm -hmm. but there was always laughter to go with the food yep. I kind of, I've kind of wondered something with these oral histories, and there's two of you there, so you can argue about it if there's anything to argue about. But I've, I've always wondered, you know, since you've spent your whole lives in this area, specifically here, do you feel like, do you feel like, what you had for opportunities when you were young? you know, your, your late teens and your 20s. You know, to me, I, I was kind of raised similar from similar grandparents. And I think, you know, like those family members that I got in, that are from that, still in that area, you know, they just did the work that was available, right? <laughs> you know, as, as close to their interests as they could. And I, I, I wonder if it seems to y'all like that it is different now? Do you, do you feel like your grandkids, you know, kind of have the same options along those lines or do you feel like things have changed? Okay, Walt, you've stayed here the whole time. I, yeah. uh, I couldn't wait to grow up and leave. I, I always <laughs> wanted to go to town. Now I live in town and I want to come back. Right. <laughs> so. Of course, the opportunities have changed. Uh, you know, back then, there was work here, uh, you know, uh, farming and sawmilling and, and stuff like that, that was local here. Now, you have to go somewhere else to work, for the most part. Now, I would agree with that, with what Aunt Linda said is, um, if, I, if you don't mind if I chime in as well, um, is I, I grew up in Mentone. I was, this was my, this was and still is my home. Um, and as a, a young person, I didn't appreciate all that was here. It was too quiet, there was nothing to do, there wasn't the activities, you know, all of that. You know, I was kind of like, I was, I was ready to go. I couldn't wait to be gone. Um, and now looking with what my children do have and so very, very grateful for the amazing opportunities they do have with you know, a, a diverse education and um, those kind of things. But there's things that they do miss um, and they miss out on um, being being away and being in a larger place. We, it's Scottsboro, it's not huge. Um, it's not like a Tampa, Florida thing, but you know, it's, it's larger. Um, but we don't have, we have absolutely no immediate family there where we grew up i literally grew up in a house next door to my grandparents um and i feel like my children have missed out 
course they get to see my parents, you know, um, but they missed out on the closeness of, of cousins and the Sunday lunches, you know, every single week and that kind of stuff. So I think, you know, they have amazing opportunities, but they've also missed out on a lot that being from a smaller area could have given them as well. I've got a little story about Walt with the kids. Uh oh. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My parents owned a grocery store and service station in Minneton for 32 years. And it was just a local gathering place. Uh, had a big one morning heater in the store. That's how we heated. And we lived in the back part. I grew up in it. But uh, Bill, their daddy, would bring them down to the store. And they had several chairs around the store. But they looked stew, homemade, about so long. And Walt, his sister, maybe two of them, I just remember, they would sit right there and never move the whole time they was in there. And they'd get an ice cream cone or a drink. And that's, it was quiet. Most of the kids come in there raising cane for something to sweet to eat. <laughs> but they were always quiet and well behaved. I remember one time we went to your daddy's store and Miss Catherine was going to dip us some ice cream, and she asked Walt what kind he wanted, and he wanted blue. <laughs> <laughs> she didn't have any blue ice cream. <laughs> and there at the store, Daddy would give me a nickel to get candy with. You know, you get a pretty good mess of candy for a nickel back then. And uh, your mom would, would get out a small sack to put my little handful of candy in, and I'd say, I want a big sack. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I should have read the article, Kelly, to know better when the hitching post was built, but what memories do you have of the hitching post? Obviously, you went there or did stuff there just the post office is all I remember. Really? I, I wasn't involved in the upstairs. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> we were too young. We were too young to go dancing. I, and I remember after the post office moved, then Clyde Lance had a beauty shop in there, and her niece Janice was my best friend, and she was an apprentice to Clyde, and I would go in there to, you know, get. Janice to fix my hair, and Clyde always fixed mothers. But that was something I remember about it. Going to the beauty shop. <laughs> I'm curious that each of you have uh, notes that you've, you've had in your hands, but, and I'm just curious to hear all of the stories, but what are, what are two of the stories that maybe we haven't touched on that you've got? I don't know. I haven't been looking at my notes. And, and as you look at that, one, one thing I was curious about, like when you were in your teens and That's growing up with the family, were, were you expected to kind of work all the time to support things around the home and the property? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we had chores. And, uh, of course, uh, you know, with our gardens and patches, we Daddy always had a, a pretty big peanut patch and sweet potatoes and field peas. Uh, and uh, we, we was expected to do our part. <laughs> and uh, of course we, we always had wood heat, uh, fireplace and heaters. And uh, we'd have to, Daddy, he didn't have a chainsaw, but you know them old chainsaws that you had to manually operate? <laughs> The small stuff we had to cut up by hand, <laughs> and uh, a lot of time in the winter uh, we wouldn't get wood up to the house where it's handy. One winter it got down below zero. I mean it's cold for a couple of weeks, and and uh, snow on the ground or ice, and uh, we didn't have enough wood up at the house, and uh, it seemed like a half mile away at the time, but it wasn't that far. And me and my brother would take about a, a half a wheelbar load at a time and took both of us to get into the house. Well, it was so cold, 
the hair in my nose froze up. <laughs> and I couldn't breathe. And I thought, here I am over here in the woods and I'm fixing to die. <laughs> And then you come to me, well, open your mouth, stupid. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't freeze. <laughs> but we, all, we always had chores. Uh, and we did them because, you know, we knew there was consequences if we didn't. <laughs> and my sisters and I worked at Count DeSoto in the summer after we got to be teenagers. Made three hundred dollars for the whole summer. That was we were rich. <laughs> and uh, about the, uh, of course, our great grandparents had the house out here at the Murph Murph House now. And I guess probably some of the first money I made was working for Grandma Shigley. <laughs> <laughs> she hired Walt and me to work all day for her. She gave him a dime and me a nickel. <laughs> on top of that, she had me a cutting uh, briars and bushes out of the fence out behind the house, and I lost my knife and only got paid a nickel or a dime. And that, that's the worst part, was losing my knife. <laughs> why, why did you only get a nickel and he had a dime? Because he was a boy and I was a girl. <laughs> <laughs> she didn't know anything about women's liberation, women's <laughs> equality. And while you still care that to, you tend those grounds, right? Yeah. There used to be an apple orchard there? Well, uh, yeah. Uh, part of it was, a, I can remember. The part of it was in a pasture, and they had a cow. Uh, but I remember out in front of the house was, uh, I guess it's all different kind of fruit, but no, it's mostly apples, I think. So you, you you don't get paid for that now, though, right? So you, your grandma was paying you better than what you did. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's, still... That's my therapy. <laughs> <laughs> there's still one of those apple trees that's living. Yeah, they? they're they're slowly dying, though, and the apples aren't good anymore. Hmm. You remember our Easter egg hunt was in your grandparents over there mm -hmm. in your little pasture yeah. area. Our school Easter egg hunt. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you remember the time we went, we walked from the school through the woods to the babies and had a bonfire and the wiener rose? Do you remember that? Yeah, it was that so was, nice. We walked all the way through the woods to baby sawmill and <coughs> then had a bonfire with wiener roast and marshmallows. And that's when Mr. and Ms. Adams were in the mm -hmm. I have some of my grandmother's old journals, and it seems like people socialized more oh. back then than mm -hmm. we do now. Mm -hmm. oh, Can yeah. you talk about that? Well, every, every Sunday, we was either at somebody's house or some, or people was at our house, you know, go home from church. I know uh, the Crow family, uh, we was down there and they was at our house just a whole lot. And uh, I, don't, I can't remember, it seemed like it's others. A lot of times you'd just go riding. If you saw somebody sitting on the porch, you'd just stop and visit. <laughs> and Mother used to walk to, to the neighbors, like to your grandmother's house and to the Cootsies and Bains. to the Bains. I mean, you know, they'd walk and they'd take flower cuttings and they'd swap um, <clears throat> sacks, you know, like the flower sacks and feed sacks and things. They, they, would, they had patterned ones and they would swap them with each other, like, okay, I've got one like this, and you've got two <laughs> like that, you know, let's swap and get enough to make a dress or something. They, that was, I mean, that was precious times with neighbors just, you know, visiting and sharing. And now we get in our own car and go somewhere. Speaking of car, I think you should tell about your mother's incident 
<laughs> Mother, uh, she she didn't learn to drive until, well, I can remember when we was little, she drove anyway. Uh, after Dad died, uh, Mother uh, drove, and she never. 45 mile an hour was wide open for her. I mean, she never drove over 45. She was going to, I think she's going to a doctor one day in Fort Payne, and uh, she came by here and, and uh, during uh, school starting and school got out, the police was sent here in front of the church. Well, she was coming back 45 mile an hour. And there's, you know, they sign out there, you know, speed limits 35 during you know, two hour time or whatever. Well, she's doing 45. Well, she got on by and the police pulled out behind her and uh, she just kept going. And uh, he just blinked his headlights. She just kept going. Finally, he turned on the, turned on the blue lights. She just kept going. Well, by then she'd got almost up to Mentone and he finally turned on the siren. <laughs> <laughs> well, she pulled over there where the wide place in the road there where the market is now, and he pulled in behind her and got out and goes and Miss Pullen or said uh, he wanted to see her license, and so she showed him her license and he said, uh, Miss Pullen, uh, didn't you see me back there? She said, Yeah, you could have passed me anytime you wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> And she died thinking nobody knew she got stopped for speeding. <laughs> and come, it's, it, it, that day just happened to be uh, some election up at town hall. Well, the police, it tickled her, it tickled him. So he went back up to town hall telling about Miss Pullen and speeding. <laughs> and, you know, in two hours, everybody in Mentone knew that Miss Pullen had been stopped for speeding. But she never let on and and it got to where she didn't drive and we'd take her full pain and uh, every time we'd get over, you better slow down, the police may be over here. <laughs> but she never said she got stopped for speed. <laughs> well, I do believe our time's up for the day um, and for the, for the interview process itself, but... Um, you have told okay. some great stories. Yeah. <laughs> We've enjoyed it. It's been good. So, so